The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. What I have in mind for today is uh, mainly, believe it or not, uh, to go through uh, some vocabulary strengthening. Uh, we've gotten to a point now where um, I think the rest of the semester is going to be much on what you all want to do, but next week is narrative ethics. Uh, but so I'd like to make sure we we are getting a good vocabulary build up, and there'll be time for anything else. I brought this in here in case I need it. It's like a um, what do you call it? Um, Coaches have these blankets, security blankets, like a security blanket. But I don't intend to use it. <laughs> but uh, if something comes up, then I got my security blanket. Uh, but I'd like to go through some definitions. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about some kinds of definitions. Some kinds of uh, definitions of words. One is called plain language. And the opposite, not the opposite, but the, but the uh, contrast, contrasting term is term of art. So we can use the word, for example, stress in plain language. I got stressed out. Uh, we can use the term stress in uh, at least uh, two terms of art. Uh, one is if you are a, a physician, stress has a specific meaning. Next, if you are a uh, civil engineer, stress has a specific meaning. And specific, those are terms of art. Okay. Now, in engineering, and I would uh, think that it is so the same is true in medicine, and the same is true in law, that when you encounter a term of art, there is a standard meaning. So if you're a lawyer, or if you're not a lawyer, believe it or not, I got a copy of Black's Law Dictionary, that thick. I can read it. Okay. Now, some of the terms are tedious because they cross-reference a whole lot of other terms. And when I say tedious, it becomes too tedious for me to get through. But... Um, I would say that of the terms that I've looked up in there, and I don't know how many terms I've looked up in there, maybe 30 over the years, I guess, but just thumbing through it too, uh, a lot I can learn because in blacks they give examples of the usage. And uh, I don't think that having, it's an interesting thing about learning, I don't think that having understood those terms that I could re use them properly. Uh, but I had to do this um, uh, when I was chair of the faculty senate. How it has a law school, <laughs> mm -hmm. and the lawyers and the political scientists uh, can use their specialty skills mm -hmm. in a faculty meeting. The engineers come in there <laughs> with those skills, so it was helpful to to at least learn that there's some differences. Um, I also had an experience once where um, I was in a meeting and somebody asked me to define engineering ethics. So I defined it. And this person was a physician. And she looked in this book, this um, 
Encyclopedia of, 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 of Ethics found engineering ethics and it says something different. I said, hold it. Something different. Okay. Term of art. It just so happened that she looked in the particular Encyclopedia of Ethics where I wrote the engineering ethics citation. Yeah. <laughs> but, then, but you told her something different? But I told her something different. Huh. And she said, and then, and then she, she saw my name down there, and she says, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. I said, well, when you go to some other disciplines like philosophy, a term of art has a definition that's usually located in a particular scholar, like Plato or Aristotle. And that when you write a paper, you reference two or three usages by certain scholars, and then you decide, tell people how you are going to use it in that context today. An engineer doesn't do that with the word stress. <laughs> okay. All right. So what I'm going to do, what, what, I'm going, what I'm going to do is to conduct a class where we're going to experience all three levels and we just have to be clear on which ones we're talking about. So when it comes to certain things, I feel authorized to give a definition just like anybody else. You look in the encyclopedia of, of philosophy, you'll find something else. Okay, I've got to justify my usage. You've got to decide which one you're going to use. My, ins my experience tells me that over time, you'll be doing the same thing. Uh, so you just have to have one that's defensible in the end. So we'll mix them up. When you say all three levels, Could, uh, of, I, what do you mean? Uh, really? One level is uh, plain language. Okay. One level is um, standardized term of art. Okay. And the other one is, I don't have a name for it. But it's what you're talking about in the example. The of last example. Book. That you can, in, in other words, a it's sort of individual justifiable, individually justifiable. So you give a name to it. Maybe you can find a name for it. I haven't got yeah. So uh, if if a philosopher is talking, it's it's legitimate to say, well, what do you mean uh, by the word ethics? And chances are the philosopher will not give you a dictionary or an encyclopedic definition. Chances are they will reference what some scholar said or how some scholar used it in certain works and say that I will use it much the same way but change it a little bit. They'll have to change it a little bit because most of those scholars lived 2,000 years ago. <laughs> you know, to make it apply to today, you have to. All right. Not only that, but their translations. <laughs> Okay, uh, so um, let's let's go through some of that. Um, let's see, do I have? I do. Um, I've got an airport card, but for some reason or another, I have not been able to get it to work in here, in this room. Yeah. Yeah, why don't you get it out, and uh, whenever we um, want to, we can just look something up. We can, um, I think uh, the best one for the, for the terms we're going to look at is, uh, how do you pronounce it, Wikipedia? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let me erase this board, and let's go through a couple of them. You bring up some. You can bring, bring up some that you want to ask me about. Bring up some that you want to say, tell. It's good practice. What category of words are we talking about? Words that, we're, that we've used, terms of art, uh, words that we've used in this class. Okay. Words that you think that if you're talking to anybody about engineering ethics may come up in the conversation and you would want to know what they mean. Yeah. yeah. Like some safe discussion or responsibility mm -hmm. um, And I think accountability is an interesting word that gets used in a lot of different ways. So that might be one to talk about. 
Well, let's do it now. Let's go back over it. Um, I will give you the term as I understood it in my military experience. And the term goes with two other terms. Uh, responsibility, authority, and accountability. They all go together. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Yes, with facts. But I, I feel like in ethics, writing and ethics literature, the word accountability needs to be used in a different way. But I don't know. That's, so that's my question. You know, you don't hear, right, you don't hear a whole lot of, of that word used unless they're using it like uh, a person in a case would use it. But, um, No, it's not used a whole lot. Okay. No. But it, it, but I think that it's impo the, the importance of it is to distinguish accountability from responsibility. Mm -hmm. And responsibility is used. Is used. Yeah. And that is you are answerable and sanctionable for some event mm -hmm. or for something. For something. So uh, you... Um, and in order to answer, you have to have authority. So uh, you have to have power. And power is given to uh, the person in order to carry out one's responsibility. You're not given any more. And you're really not given any less. You're given what somebody, what somebody above you in authority ch uh, in the chain of command thinks that is what you need to carry out your responsibility. All right. So uh, one very important thing about all of that in life, professional life, is that you can delegate authority. The bigger the organization, the higher up you are in it, the only way you can operate is to delegate authority. Um, if you look at the charter of the charters of some universities, and I've looked at some. Uh, the trustees have all of this authority that they cannot possibly <laughs> use. <laughs> right. Um, if you look at the original versions of the charters that go back into the 19th century, they will give the trustees the authority to prescribe textbooks for classes. Now, you know, even in the last century, Trustees couldn't do that. They had to delegate the authority to. Right? But what the trustee cannot do is delegate the responsibility. Because if the students aren't taught and, they, and the charter, which is a contract between the organization and society, uh, if the charter says that you have to teach students and if the higher body, that is the the, the legal body of, no, no, let's call it the body politic of society says that we're just going to sanction somebody for that, then you're the one, not the others. Okay. Uh, and accountability, the judge is going to say, well, look, before we get started, let's put some facts on the table. Who should know the facts? Okay. And that's accountability. So, um, so you see how these issues can come up. When they do come up, they come up uh, in, in what uh, is a term of art now, sensational uh, cases. Mila <laughs> and all of them. Okay. Um, Is that a correct use 
advantage of it, or in ethics should it also just be answerable? I'll also use the word. So is passive? You, that's I see what you're saying. No, I see. I use the word event okay. also, okay, which means action, All right? So, uh, yeah, it's proactive. But, well, I can I, I'm trying to think now. Can I think of something passive? Can I say I am responsible to prevent? Maybe the better word is obligated. Like, you're morally obligated to do something. All right. And then you have yeah. moral responsibility. Now. Now you're getting into an ethical or a term of art in ethics mm -hmm. because Immanuel Kant has some specific definitions for duty and obligation. Okay. So if you substitute the word duty for obligation, then you get a term of art in ethics. And as a matter of fact, uh, many people call Kant's ethics duty ethics okay duty ethics and um, and uh, that's a very powerful word uh, in some cultures because your duty your duty uh, not only has military connota connotations that are passed on in business, but it also has moral connotations that come from Immanuel Kant. Okay, so put, a, put an asterisk beside that. Do some reading on that, please. Uh, a simple definition is not going to be good enough. But, in, but Kant's, Kant's ethics are often called duty ethics. And as you know, his style is to state the categorical imperative in more than one way. He says they mean the same thing. They're just different statements of the same thing. But, I, but, they, but, they're, but if they were the same thing, why state them differently? So there's some con connotation that's different in them. You have to read a little bit about that. Um, they also have another, excuse me, a political. On my honor, I'll do my duty. <laughs> yeah, duty, I, I like that you brought up. Duty, honor, country. Culture. That's a good that's a good point. Since the '60s, it has been. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's going to pass, right. but up until the '60s, um, people would say you have a duty, and someone would stand back and says, "Yes, I have a duty." Mm -hmm. And in the '60s, they, that was an that was an adverse term. Well, part, part of the 60s was anti-Vietnam. And part of that was anti-war in general. And a lot of that was anti-military. Uh, I wore my military uniform in Georgetown on a Saturday night <laughs> in the 60s, just to see what would happen. And um, place, it was crowded. And all of the anti, you know, all of the uh, anti-war people were there. And I walked three blocks, and I remember the number six. I was invited to six fisticuffs. <laughs> Just on account. Notice the word, I was invited. I did not accept the invitation, nor was the invitation fo foisted on me. <laughs> Nobody took the first punch. <laughs> but yeah, it came to that. I just wanted to see, I mean, uh, 
I, I, uh, I just want to see what would really happen. Um, and so, and I, 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 I was uh, an objection. Uh, I objected to uh, uh, the war when I was in the army. Uh, I had a talk with my commander. My commander said, Do "You plan to object to the war when you're in uniform." I said, "No." He said, "Do you plan to object to the war when you're on duty?" I said, "No." He said, well, what you do with your other time is none of my business. So I did not object to the military. Um, so, and I, and I did not object to war. I thought that there was such a thing as a defensive war. Um, but um, uh, I just wanted to see what would, what would happen, and, it was, and that's what happened. So the word duty... Uh, did fall in disfavor, for, I think, for many of those reasons in the 60s. And as long as my generation is around, it will probably have those connotations. But we're uh, being uh, we're going out of the system now. <laughs> and I suspect that duty will return and have its uh, original force here in the United States. What about ethics? What's the difference between ethics and morals? Did I ever cover that? Okay, well, let's, let's deal with ethics and morals because I'll tell you this one thing that's for sure. And that is that if you ever start talking about engineering ethics and, there, and there's anybody in there who's not a philosopher, somebody's going to say, hold it, what's the difference between ethics and morals? And they're going to say it because they will have different responses to your calling them unethical as opposed to immoral. Yeah. And they want to set this up right at the beginning. <laughs> okay. And, um, and so I've had experiences, and I'll, I'll tell you an experience that tends to work, and that is to say, well, let's start with a word called etymology. And that's the study of the origins of words. Okay. And <clears throat> now here's this story. Um, there's a piece of it, and I'm not sure what it is that's anecdotal, but I'd like for you to see if you can work this out and give me... Um, give me a um, cogent etym etymological answer. It seems as though Aristotle had to his advantage the Greek word ethos. We still use that word. And depending on who's translating the word, it might have slightly different meanings. Uh, because uh, this word uh, seems to uh, give translators into English a little bit of a problem. Let me pause there for a second. No, I'll come back. I'll come back. And ethos had all of these meanings about what people thought uh, were um, behaviors uh, and values that were used in a particular community. So this community, and we're talking about city, city states now, we're not going to talk before nations. So when you talk about a community, you're talking about a city state, which was their equivalent to a nation. Because city states will go to war with one another. If you don't believe it, look at Athens and the... <laughs> Sparta. <laughs> but they were much more manageable-sized people. I mean, uh, Are you saying that there weren't a whole lot of riots? No, I'm just saying... 
They're smaller. The theory about the governance of city states. Yes. Is not is not easily applied to a nation. Oh right, right. Oh yeah. Oh okay, right. So you said they were the equivalent of nations, but no, they weren't. No, 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 they weren't. But um, uh, no. It was the best thing they had to a nation then. Right. All right. All right. Um, is that right? In, in Greece, that was right. It wasn't right in Egypt. No, they had empires. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so you're talking about ethos. And Aristotle wanted to talk about uh, the study of ethos to determine good and bad, right and wrong. And he didn't have a word for it. So he came up with this word, ethikos. And that word finally gets itself into the English language as ethics. Uh, the um, habits and values that people had in a particular community. And then ethicos was the study of the question. The rational study of it. So uh, the way I look at the difference is that the first one is um, empirical. And the second one is rational. That's the way I look at it. I don't know if I can defend it, but that's the way I look at it that the second one really is, is analyzing the first one, talking about it. Okay. So all of this is in Greek. Uh, is Greek. Okay. Cicero, who was a Roman, comes along and um, he was a Roman, he was a Roman, they call him an orator, but he was a lawyer. He was trained in um, Greek philosophy. Uh, he left Rome when he was young. His father sent him over there to uh, one of the, the academies. I think it was uh, Aristotle's academy that was still alive in those days. And he studied over there. And he translated some words. Uh, there was already an equivalent in Latin for ethos, and it was mores. We still use that word. Ways and mores and all of that. We might take a pause uh, in, in a few minutes to get on Wikipedia and see what some of this, some of, that, some, some of what they say. Uh, and when he got to ethicos, there was no Latin equivalent. So, um, my th sources are not unimpeachable, but it seems to, but it seems that, but I've got sources, I've got references that say that Cicero came up with this word moralis, moralis as the Latin equivalent of ethicos. And... That works its way into the English language as morals. Now let's talk about usage in the English language. Some usages. Okay. Um... There is a branch of philosophy, a major division of philosophy, called ethics. There is an equivalent term for ethics, moral philosophy. It's improper to say ethical philosophy.
uh, a great deal of uh, work in the area of ethics, as you know, because we covered it earlier, was done uh, by uh, theologians. Not just Christian the theologians, but obviously all theologians uh, deal with ethics in one way or another. In the Western world, it was done in, guess what, Latin. Now, uh, some, uh, there were some great scholars referred to uh, Greek writings too. But there were periods, long periods, where when uh, Christianity was hostile to Greek learning. So uh, what happens when somebody says that you are immoral is that they are probably talking about the Latin treatment in the context of religion. That's bad. Okay. <laughs> All right. There is such a thing called um, professional. There's a term called professional ethics, as you know, term of art. And engineering ethics um, includes professional ethics. When they talk about professional ethics, they're usually talking about, or in the main, they're talking about codes of ethics and the discussions that are, uh, and ethical discussions around codes of ethics to include cases, all right? But um, there is a term called professional ethics, but there is no term called professional morals. <laughs> right. So when somebody says you're unethical, what that means is that it's, this one is an assault on your character in terms of religion, this was an assault on your behavior in terms of your working environment. All right. So all of this has to do with usage. How does a word get its meaning just simply by people using it a certain way and not using it another way? It's got nothing to do with logic. It's entirely empirical. Okay, so if you are in some kind of a meeting, let's say or you're some kind of committee, um, and you have to deal with an issue like this, let's say, uh, I don't know, the PTA. Okay, and some students got caught cheating. They, they, uh, the principal sets up, or the, uh, uh, the president of the PTA sets up an ethics committee. I say, oh, you studied ethics in college, you'd be the chair of the committee. Well, you got 500 people sitting in the audience, and the first thing they want to know is, what's the difference between ethics and morals? <laughs> All right. uh, today in philosophy, or among philosophers, they, and this is a popular thing, but no one philosopher is constrained to do it. But it's most popular to talk about morals, um, very much like we talk about mores. What do people say is good and right? What do they say is bad and wrong? That's sort of the norm. Norm. Like normative, yeah, right. Now, I'm going to get into something, so let's not get confused with normative ethics. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Right. And I'll I tell you one problem I had with this word normative, the word normative, when I first uh, heard it, and that was normal. I'll come back. Yeah, let's go. I'll come back to that. All right. Remind me to come back if I don't very soon. All right. So what was I saying? Morals is used to talk about what people say. Right. Today in philosophy. Morals have to do with all of those issues, and ethics has to do with the systematic study of them. Okay, so uh, that is, um, if, a per if a person wants to use the difference, 
If you get a research paper, you may find something altogether different. The good news is if they use something different, they'll say it. They'll tell you exactly what their meanings are. Okay, so if you look up a journal, you know, ethics. Okay. Um, now, let's talk about, when I use the word ethics, unless, unless it's clear by the context or I, unless you ask me, I am talking about a branch of philosophy called ethics, and I could very well be talking about moral philosophy. This course is called Engineering Ethics, so I would choose more to use ethics. Okay. But they mean the same thing. Now, <clears throat> philosophy, depending on who you talk to, has three, or depending on who you talk to, may have four major divisions big divisions of philosophy, and then we'll talk about, and, eth and, and here's the way it goes. Um, I want to keep this down. I want to keep that on the board over there. We can't see this, so what am I going to do? Uh, I'll erase this. Okay, philosophy. <clears throat> All right, now, one of your great divisions, and I think I gave a short lecture on this, called metaphysics. And metaphysics is is about uh, saying what a thing is and what sort of thing it is. Uh, it talks about the rational world as opposed to the um, uh, real world, and the real world as opposed to the hyper-real world or hyperspace. Okay, when you talk talk about all of those kinds of discussions, you're in the realm of metaphysics. Okay, the next one is epistemology. And epistemology uh, has another name, theory of knowledge. What do you know, and how do you know it? <laughs> All right. um, the next one is called axiology. And the best way to define axiology is to say it has, that, that is a word that has two references. One of the words is ethics, and the other one is aesthetics. Okay, so when we study ethics, I think that um, it's fair to say that we're discussing uh, a very large division of philosophy. Now, I am going to put in dotted lines. Another division. And um, this other, di this dotted line is not so much debated as it is 
that when you start looking at all the various areas of philosophy, some of them don't fit into these categories. <laughs> now, when you, now you, you can imagine, most of them fit somewhere overlapping. None of them, very few of them fit directly under. You know, you're not, you're not going to get an organizational chart out of this. You're going to get a Venn diagram. All right. Um, but there's another one over there that uh, deserves a name. Uh, some people have proposed names. Nobody likes them. Uh, but I will give you a name that, if, that you can use and everybody will know what you're talking about. They will argue with you about using this word, but they, but they won't have another word. Okay. I want you to know that word, praxis. Now, I'll, uh, I'll tell you uh, what praxis means, why it's an unpopular term in the United States, uh, and some of the other areas about, uh, under it. Um, praxis is a word that was, I don't think Karl Marx invented the word but he popularized it. Okay. So you see <laughs> that if you use the word praxis, then somebody who uh, really has an emotional um, aversion to communism is going to ask you if you're a commie. <laughs> I use the word frequently. <laughs> they don't like it. Okay, let me give you some other words. There is a, a branch of philosophy called And you can use it E O L O G Y, and you can use it I O L O G Y, praxeology. Now, but first, let me say what praxis means. Praxis means the theory about. The theory that just precedes action. In other words, you got an abstract concept, like Newton's second law. Okay. You got an airplane that has lost its propulsion, its power, is getting ready to fall out of the sky. And you want to figure out how long it's going to take. The argument is that you don't go directly. The mind does not go directly from the abstract theory to the practical application. Something happens in the, in the middle. Yeah, I've heard it defined as theory into action. Theory into action. I've never heard that term, but I can use that. Theory into action. Now, in philosophy, there is a, a robust body uh, or a robust category of philosophy called action theory or theory of action. You can write a dissertation on theory of action in most any big university. When I say big university, any university that has a philosophy department that has enough faculty to cover the others. Theory of action is not ethics. It overlaps. This is a term of art, theory of action. Oh. And it follows under practice? Ah, uh, Venn diagram. It falls closer under practice than any of the rest of them. Yeah. But, the, but praxis is really talking about theory just before you act. 
theory of action is talking about praxis and action. But if uh, you want to write your dissertation on action theory, you go to any department where they can cover these three and have faculty left over, you will be able to do this. <laughs> okay. And, all right, so theory of action is big. Hi, Tony. We're doing um, definitions, vocabulary. Not a structured approach. Uh, now, people who talk about, oh, let's keep on, let's keep going a minute. There is, there is a uh, very interesting word here, praxeology. That is a translation of a Polish term. Okay. Interesting background. I want to elaborate. I have a confession as to why I want to elaborate. <laughs> uh, Macmillan has a new uh, encyclopedia of philosophy coming out. And the most interesting citation in it is the one on praxeology. This rat is beginning to get suspicious. <laughs> Why did I say most interesting? That's a very loaded term <laughs> for a class like, no, I wrote it. <laughs> well, I mean, that was, uh, that was a labor. We're not talking about a whole lot of words. I can't remember how many words it was. I, I think I gave them about 10 pages. That was a lot of research. Uh, what happens is, is that praxeology got its start by a man named Kodarbinski. He's Polish. Now this being Polish is very significant. Okay? Because all of the development of praxeology, it's it reached its it developed from Kodarbinski and got its rich maturity during a time when Poland was politically cut off from the West. We could not get the papers out, and we could not get papers in. Okay. So we became aware of, when I say we, most scholars, most of us. There were some who traveled in Poland during those days uh, and talked about uh, philosophy talked about well I think John Dewey somebody traveled in there and came back talking about pragmatism okay so praxeology um, came out when uh, let me see if I can pronounce his name correctly if I cannot pronounce his name correctly his first name is Carol K-A-R-O-L you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. Pope John Paul II. Right. <laughs> W-O-L-T and then more. It's hard. Yes. Now, uh, incidentally, um, now I qualified in Russian. Qualified in Russian and French. Uh, I can still read Russian. I don't mean read it with understanding, but I can pronounce the words correctly. Polish is different, but unless they throw one of those accents in there on top of the letter, and they've got a lot of them in Pol Polish, I could pronounce his name. Wojciechowicz, I think it's pretty, is, let's say that's about 70, 80% right. <laughs> But if they wrote it in Polish, I could probably get it about 95% right. Okay. Uh, when he became Pope, that opened up all of this scholarship from Poland to the West. And it was around that time 
that praxeology got into uh, philosophy and there. And what they are doing, what I said that they were doing it with praxeology was writing a general theory for the learned disciplines that we call the practical learned disciplines. Law, medicine, engineering, social work, but not sociology. Business, but not economics. See where I'm going with this? So the discipline that prepares people directly for professions. Yes. And that they were, they were, de they were trying to develop a, a, a branch of philosophy that would guide those, uh, that discussion. Okay. So what they were trying to do was to get, open up this whole new category. And they did pretty good at it, I think. Uh, they suffered because they did not have wider, de uh, wider scope of debate. They only had themselves. And they were pretty much sold on, uh, well, you know how it is. The four of us get together and say, we're going to invent a whole new category of philosophy. We're pretty much of one mind from the start. <laughs> it really, to mature this thing, somebody's got to come in from left field. You know, come in. So they were cut off, politically cut off from the Western world. So, um, but I think that whatever you do with this uh, chart, remember that when the definitions come up, we're talking about a Venn diagram, not an organizational chart, because things don't fit neatly into these categories. But almost everybody will agree that, the, that these three, I'm sorry, there's one other one. There is one other one that actually fits in this category. And philosophers want to include it. Let's talk about some others that fit into this category. Uh, and sometimes they'll include it. One of them is philosophy of education. Because there is such a thing called educational psychology, which is a science, and fits very closely under epistemology. Notice this science. We're going to, I'm getting excited about this now. Let me, let me organize my thoughts. I want to go back. Let's talk about where some learned disciplines fit into these categories, fit in categories. Okay. Science. A fair, the fair, the, 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 the most accurate short statement about what science is is that is a learned discipline for the production of knowledge about the physical world in pursuit of the truth about the physical world. So therefore, science would be closer to epistemology with a good enough overlap with metaphysics than in axiology. Eth ethics clearly is in ax axiology by definition, but, there, but any theory of values close, fits closer to axiology than to anything else. So if you want to talk about art, that would fit closer to axiology than anything else. Theory of beauty, if you want to talk about art. That's not the only way to talk about art, but that's one way to talk about art. Aesthetics. Uh, aesthetics. Can you, how many of them do we have? Well, think of your senses. Beauty in the eye is called aesthetic. It's called aesthetics. There's such a thing as gustatory uh, values. <laughs> gustatory. Aesthetics. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. And guess where they work? In art departments. <laughs> oh yes. 
Food, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you'll have to go to France to get a PhD in gusto. <laughs> You're not going to get a PhD in gustatory philosophy over here. But no, gustatory, uh, you know, uh, what's another one? Um, music. We can do that over here. Yes, music. Um, tactile. That's the formal term. T-A-C-T-I-L-E. It has to do with not feelings, but with feel. Not the passions, but with the sense of feeling. Um, here's another one. Probably the most important one is um, has to do with sight. That's our most important thing. But there's another one that is very, that is very, it's coming along now. And something is going to happen in your lifetimes, your, uh, your, yours too, Tori, that uh, is only going to happen uh, to me in, uh, when I'm in full retirement. And that's in the area of olfactory philosophy and praxis and all of that. You know what they've just done? I got this. I'll get this from. I've been following. Well, first of all, the olfactory, the olfactory was intriguing to me when I learned that the olfactory sense, the, uh, the, sense, the sense of smell is the only one uh, that um, does not go through the cognitive area of the mind for processing before it goes other places in the body. And the, that uh, everything else requires some processing first, some reason, uh, reason and all of that. Well, it's like you put the Necker cube up there. It's on a flat surface, but we see three-dimensional. The brain did that. Okay. Olfactory goes straight to the to the um, psychomotor. Uh, and it's supposed to be the only one. I'm talking at the level of the best uh, documentaries on television. Okay. All right. I can go a little bit further. I hang out with a lot of uh, psychiatrists. <laughs> on, on, on a you know, friendly basis. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we we talk about these things, so that too. But they but something has happened. Um, they have now been able to okay. Let, let me back up a minute. There's something that we engineers understand very well, and that is uh, in mathematics we understand what it means to talk about a basis set. We can talk about three space, X, Y, Z, and everything is either on one of the axes, in a plane. I mean, everything can be described in terms of that basic three categories. Okay. Color. Basic colors. Everything else is a mixture of them. Okay. They got the olfactory down to a basis set. <laughs> They've got it, and so now, and now, they're they're going to be able to, to do a lot of different things with it. Um, I went to a movie theater. It was a special movie theater over in Baltimore. I don't know if they still have it, but it was a movie theater. But the movies they played in there didn't last but five minutes, and they had maybe two or three movies. That was all. It was part of something else. You go in there, and it was all set up like a movie theater, but they only had these small. It was a movie theater that had these little spouts right by your seat that gave out smells. So when somebody cut an apple pie, you could smell it. I mean, God. Yeah. And, um, and, and it, it, so, but there was, there's this fear of what would happen to people if you tried to control the olfactory. 
Now, you do it with the, the, the sound. You hear a tiger in the movies, 3D. Uh, you clearly do it with the eye, okay? Um, there have been some theaters that have had, uh, that where movies had the tactile worked in. I'll tell you two of them. In some movie theaters, this movie Earthquake actually had sound thrown into the movie below the auditory level, but made you feel like that you were moving. Okay. There was another one down in North Carolina when I was a kid where they had um, another sound below the auditory level and they played it when the monster was creeping up behind this lady. And just as the monster was putting his hands, they blew that sound in. You could feel it. <laughs> People ran out of the theater. <laughs> well, that's what they said. Well, anyway, uh, that, 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 the, the olfactory may very well get into the movies. But, hello, you joining us, or are you just early for the other one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can join us, though. <laughs> um, so olfactory may be in the movies. My instincts, no, instincts, I like to use the word instinct because I believe in instincts. But I think history would tell that it's going to take a little while. First of all, um, the Wizard of Oz was not the first film to use color. A number of others came out before and people didn't like it. <laughs> so my, my guess is that, the first, that they, they start really making films with the old factory. And now they can do it because um, they can put it on a tape. And they can have the instruments there. And for every smell, you don't need a different pipe organ like they had in this theater. For every smell, they had a different... Um, tube. Here, you all you have to do is have the basic set, basis set, and mix them properly. Get any smell you want. Well, they're going to have to work out uh, the danger levels of all that, because some of our smells operate below the level of consciousness, and they tell us who we like and who we don't like. Yeah. Um, and all these other things, uh, perfume. Oh, they're going to be. It was going to be some. It was going to be some real ethics problems. Uh, perfumes, you know, they come from these glands from these animals. A lot of them. So the animals are using the perfumes on each other, and then we put we turn it into perfume, and the perfume operates at below the level of consciousness. It's not just uh, a kind of um, olfactory. Well, it's olfactory, but it's not purely smell. Something is working at the lower levels that's telling us about persons. And, and is this going to be really interesting when the olfactory becomes a part of everybody's life, consciously becomes a part of everybody's life, particularly in the movies. So look out for that one. <clears throat> People are going to be writing dissertations on that. <laughs> I, uh, now, I'm going to tell you how, uh, what mythology can do. I read a science fiction book. Uh, I got it at home. Uh, this guy goes to this, no, no. These beings from another planet come to Earth and for some reason want to take this guy back with them to their planet. I think a crime has been committed on their planet. And they don't have they don't have a history of crime, so they come down here to get a detective, Sherlock Holmes, and take the person back to help them find this crime. Well, these beings, the sentient beings on this other planet, evolved from lizards, and uh, the main character is the equivalent of um, of uh, Michael Jackson. Or uh, now I don't want to use Michael Jackson. Uh, is uh, no, he's a big rock star. But his instrument is not music; it's olfactory. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 
and and he's able to mix these sounds and everybody's oh my this guy's a great artist <laughs> and the human being can't get it <laughs> right yeah so he's mixing these olfactory chords and playing <laughs> And uh, that's how science fiction can, can develop a mythology that gets, a, gets us ready for stuff. So now I think I have a basis for sort of thinking about what life would be like if the old factory got in there. Okay. Uh, so um, I believe that philosophy of engineering fits over here in this category. Now we have something we can... We, we, we can start with, and then I'm done on this piece, and we can go to some others. We got, we got um, nine minutes. No, we have 14 minutes, um, which is good time. Now, um, there is, there exists two branches of philosophy that go together. The differences are subtle. One is called theory of law, and the other one is called jurisprudence. And depending on what um, encyclopedia you, you get or what dictionary you're looking at, they will either equate theory of law to jurisprudence or they'll go off in a long dissertation about how they're different. And uh, and um, you will think that they're splitting hairs. I anticipate you'll think that they're splitting hairs. Here's what I th think the difference is. When I say I think, no, here's my learned judgment about the difference. There is a difference. Okay. Theory of law is, when you look at, I've looked at the journals, written mainly by philosophers. Jurisprudence, written mainly by lawyers. You can say that they're the same thing, but they will be, the lawyers will be interested in different topics than the philosophers. And the lawyers will write in an almost legalistic style, whereas the philosophers will write in a philosophical style. So um, uh, when you go to a law school, any lawyer with a JD can teach jurisprudence. Um, but not every lawyer can teach theory of law, and certainly not every philosopher can teach theory of law. And I would say that none of them can teach jurisprudence because they don't practice law. So it's practitioners of law that do it. All right. Now this statement is very important because I think that all of this is going to break down into categories like this when it comes to the practical disciplines, once we start doing more work in the practical disciplines. That what you're going to, what you see already is that in philosophy of education, there are people whose dissertations were in philosophy of education, and nobody else teaches philosophy of education. But then there are journals that talk about philosophical issues in education written by educators who've never taken a course in philosophy, but who are talking to each other about what their discipline constitutes. So and please anticipate in your lifetime that much more discussion is going to take place in this category. And when it does, it will break out into these two categories. And... Uh, that philosophy of engineering will essentially break out, like I think it is already, between philosophical issues that practicing engineers talk to each other about and philosophical issues that philosophers or philosophers slash engineer, like myself, uh, want to talk to mainly the general public about.
not so much each other. Now, there was a term I said I was going to get to. I asked y'all to remind me. Um, maybe I got to it. Where? Oh, I said education. It was education. Education exists out there only because there's been a whole lot of philosophical discussion. Devote. Oh, I know what it was. It was um, normative ethics. <laughs> Um, but I think that education really belongs in the practice category. But some but, people separate and take a different They don't know what to do with it. They just know that there's a lot of work that's been done by a lot of great thinkers who've used the tools and methods of philosophy to, just, to discuss education, but they don't know where to put it because most of it is still not knowledge. You just don't come into a classroom with 30 12-year-olds and start using a systematic approach to teach them mathematics. There's something else involved. It's an art form. It's like engineering. There's something that is not parts of that. So they don't really know where to put it. Uh, like I said, there's so much of it, and so many great minds have, put, have been put, uh, put to the task on it that they can't ignore it. And in a school of education, in a big state university, you will find at least one faculty member who does philosophy of education. I think that's a fair statement. I don't know of any that don't. You got to take a course in it if you're going to get a graduate degree in it. Okay. Now, when we go to ethics, ethics breaks out into two divisions. Okay. Oh. Uh, I'm, a, I'm going to use some terms. This is what this class is all about, terms, terminology. Okay. Um, I'm going to use three terms. Okay. Um, one is called normative ethics. And the other one is called descriptive ethics. Normative ethics um, has as its goal to um, say what you should do or should not do. Descriptive ethics says what you did and whether it was right or wrong. So Beaujolais blew the whistle. Was that right or wrong? What should he have done? You see, there are two different questions. Most ethics done by philosophers is called theoretical ethics, and they do um, normative ethics. Most applied ethics, that is applying ethics to specific kinds of cases, which constitutes the greater part of engineering ethics, is descriptive. You get a case and you say what somebody did. And you ask whether they did the right thing or the wrong thing. 
I have given equal weight to both in this class because I want you to know, I want you to be able to do normative ethics. I want you to be able to say what they should have done. Now, I've said what science is. Let's talk about science. Let's talk about, et we've talked about ethics, science, philosophy. Let's see if we can define some learned disciplines with the next four minutes that we have. Science, a learned discipline for the, on the production of knowledge about the physical world. Ethics, in uh, its most general statement, the learned discipline uh, on the production of values. We can get more specific, and we should get more specific. But if you take that t definition, however so... Um, cursory it may be, it does make a distinction between ethics and science. One studies the facts and the other one studies the values. Over in this category, we're going to be talking about engineering and, and law and others. All of them have to do with changing the world or controlling it, more precisely to intervene into it with an end in mind. So we're not about creating knowledge about the world. We're not ab about, our specialty is not about creating knowledge about the world. We may create knowledge as we go, but that's not our specialty. Our specialty is not about valuing the world. We have to include values in it, but that's not our specialty. Our specialty has to do with changing it. Now here's the subtlety in changing it. A scientist say, we change the world too. Well, we have to change the world in response to certain kinds of imperatives. You got to do it now. The in military, the enemy's coming over the hill. Engineering, we got to go to the moon. Uh, in medicine, you're sick. I can't go in the laboratory and do some more experiments. Okay. So we have a systematic approach to dealing with uh, situations that are knowledge deficient as well as values deficient. That's what makes the engineering, medicine, law, and uh, these other uh, uh, learned disciplines what they are. It's when we're able to take that leap in a systematic way. We'll talk more about it. I think we've just about gotten to the end. Um, this is a continuing saga. We'll always talk about terminology from here out. Uh, but I think I've gotten some of the main ones.